Today we are going to answer the slightly absurd question, why is it not the year 2064? This may seem like an absurd question, but it's actually a deeper and more relevant question than you probably realize. To answer why it is not the year 2064, one would think because it is obviously the year 2020. But that only leads to the follow-up question. Why is it then the year 2020? And why is it so obvious? Now, if you'll allow me, before we talk more about years, I want to take a few moments and talk about the concept of time and more specifically how we keep track of time. In an upcoming series, I will talk in more detail about the incredibly long and rich history of timekeeping. The point of this series will be to examine humanity's understanding of time and how it has transformed from uh, people in caves staring up at the moon at night until Einstein's theory of relativity changed the way we see time forever. But that is a story for another day. Today we are going to be relatively practical and examine how people use time and the fundamental importance that timekeeping has on the way societies all around the world function. In order to do that, we have to talk about an unregulated and ill-defined phenomenon called common era or current era, which is the one I use, or CE for short. So this is a practice dating back centuries. It's really only taken off over the world in the last 15 to 20 years. And it is what most scholarly work uses today. It is what I was taught and it is the one that I will mainly focus on today. But however you twist and turn it, 2020 is the official secular calendar year of the world. But just because that's the case, that doesn't mean that there are many, many, many more ways of keeping track of time, because there's a plethora of different calendars and none of them have it as being the year 2020. For example, in the Islamic calendar, which started in what we call the year 622, lunar calendar, and does not line up with the solar calendar. You can see a, a very good example of this, a very di direct comparison, in the Persian way of telling time. Now, the Persian way of telling time is based on astronomical observations and the Earth's movement around the Sun. It's a very old way of telling time and considering how long ago people started doing it, it is a downright eerily accurate calendar considering all that people had to go on was observing the stars. Traditional Islamic calendar and the Persian calendar both started in the year 622 but now, 14 centuries later, they are 43 years apart. That difference is a direct result of the accumulated days between solar calendars and lunar calendars. And so at the beginning of the year 2020 CE, in the Islamic lunar calendar, it was the year 1441. But in the Persian solar calendar, it was the year 1398. The Buddhist calendar, just to take another example, is currently at the year 2563 or 2563 years since the death of the Buddha. Another one, and arguably the most famous one, is the Chinese lunar calendar. It is a marvel in and of itself and is currently, at the time of recording, rolling along at a breathtaking and awe-inspiring 4,718. Every single year at the break of the Chinese New Year, it triggers the largest migration of people in world history when people return home to share meals with their families. Despite all of these differences, things still work from the perspective of the year 2020. 
And what this means in practice, and just to take a purely hypothetical example, I could schedule the, the construction of three bridges in three continents in the year 2023. Now, after all involved parties, um, well, they wouldn't shake hands because, you know, in COVID times, people don't shake hands anymore. But all parties sign on the dotted line and don't shake hands and go home. Now, because of this universal time agreement that we all live with, thankfully, I wouldn't find myself in a situation where one of the parties that I agreed to build a bridge with would show up in 24 months, another would show up in six centuries, and the third party would be suing me because even though I just agreed to it now, I'm somehow magically more than five centuries overdue and they want their money back. Instead, what would just happen is that people would show up and do the construction they all committed to do. Why is that? Why is this universal agreement of it being the secular year 2020? So we return to the original question. Why is it not the year 2064 if this is a secular calendar? I grew up in and have only lived with the Christianized Gregorian calendar. So I am making this video in the year 2020 AD. AD is short, is Latin and is short for Anno Domini, which technically means in the year of the Lord. The reason that I learned this, and you almost certainly did as well, as meaning the year of our Lord, is because AD, Anno Domini, is technically another abbreviation of a full phrase, which was really common, for example, in, in the medieval era, which is Anno Domini Nostri Jesu Christi, or in the year of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because everyone knew what it meant, and because they didn't feel like saying Anno Domini Nostri Jesu Christi every single time anyone made a reference to a year, and thus was born the saying in the year of our Lord, even though it still should be and technically means in the year of their Lord. And let's be honest, saying the year 2020 AD and JC just seems a bit silly, you know, because it doesn't make any sense to have an abbreviation that is one letter longer than the number of years in question. So why do we use this system? Why do we say in the year of our Lord? The reason for that is that in the 6th century in the East Roman Empire, a monk named Dionysius, called, uh, commonly known to history as Dionysius the Humble, he devised a system based on the old Roman system, which I will get into later in more detail, to account for the fact that the theological understanding that said that the uh, second coming of Jesus and the subsequent end of days were already more than a quarter of a century overdue. Now this led some people to believe that the apocalypse was just around the corner any day now. Some people suspected that the timing was off. So, in order to settle this, Dionysius devised a system splitting all of existence into the time from, so since the creation of the world, uh, right up until the birth of Christ. And he said that 5,500 years had happened from, from God's creation until the birth of Jesus Christ. And then he split the world, uh, the world and the timeline of the entire universe into this uh, dualistic system before Christ and after Christ, which is what we still use today. So Dionysius argued that instead of it being the year of the consulship of Flavius Probus, the Roman consul for the year, it was instead the year 525 of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we, who use the so-called Gregorian calendar, or variations thereof, have 365 days per year, with an added day every four years called 
a leap day and they take place on leap year to account for the fact that the solar year, which is what a year actually is, is at the time of recording, because this changes over the centuries, 365.24219 days, or roughly estimated, every year is 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes and 45 seconds. So now that we have established what a solar year is, the next obvious questions are, what is a Gregorian calendar? Why is it a special kind of calendar? And also, what is a calendar? The Gregorian calendar refers to the current way of tracking time. It is named after Pope Gregorius XIII, and it marks the transition which ended the so-called Julian calendar, which is how we used to keep track of time before it. And the Gregorian calendar uh, took place at midnight on October 4th in the year of our Lord 1582, and exactly one second later, it had become October 15th in the year of our Lord, 1582. Those missing days needed to be removed from the calendar to account for the missing minutes of every year over the, last, over the previous 16 centuries due to the Julian calendar rounding up the numbers in the year 45 BCE. This was as you would expect, met with almost universal ruthless opposition from people who had paid a full month's rent but still lost a third of their month, while not, whilst also not being paid for the missing week and a half because it didn't show up for work in those 10 non-existent days. Funnily enough, the exact same thing happened 434 years later in 2016 CE when Saudi Arabia changed from the Islamic calendar, which it had had since its inception, to the Gregorian calendar. And they used this as a way to cut the pay of its civil servants by 11 days, thus aligning the public and private sector up and saving a ton of money. It seems that even across time and religion, history has a tendency to repeat itself. The Gregorian calendar, uh, began on October 15th in the year 1582 and the Catholic countries, unsurprisingly enough, followed the divine orders of the Catholic Pope in Rome, but the Protestant countries of Europe would hold out for up to five generations before they too eventually adopted the system at the start of the 1700s. At that point, the Catholic countries and the Protestant countries of Europe were by that point, 11 days out of sync with each other. In one very famous example of anachronism, while the exactness of scholarly integrity is debatable, the story famously goes, Miguel de Cervantes, author of the phenomenal uh, masterpiece Don Quixote, and the playwright and author William Shakespeare, whose uh, blatant disregards for facts and historical accuracy infuriates historians to this very day, both died on exactly the same date, April 23rd, 1616, 10 days apart, because Catholic Spain had by then adopted the Gregorian calendar, but the nominally Protestant England had not. And so these uh, famous authors died on exactly the same day, but because of the divide between the Julian and the Gregorian calendar, they actually died more than a week and a half apart, despite their date of death both being April 23rd, 1616. And now, to establish the third question, what is a calendar? A calendar, in the shortest possible version, is a system to organize periods of time, most typically days, weeks and months, and then years, for religious or financial or social or administrative purposes so that they can coordinate with other members of the same society who use the same calendar. And this means that a date is paired with a specific day within the system. So for example, Easter Sunday always takes place on Sunday, but Christmas takes place on, on December 24th or 25th just to take an example, or New Year's Eve 
is always December 31st, but which day of the week changes depending on which year of the calendar it is. Now, a calendar derives from the Roman word calend, which was the Roman word for the first day of the month. So a calendar was simply, and quite literally, just a way of keeping track of where and when the first of the month for this year would take place. A calendar, then, being little more than a, the year's collection of calends, as tends to be the case almost exclusively throughout history, as soon as people come up with an idea that works, they don't change it, even if it's been thousands and thousands of years. And so, even though no one uses the word calend for the first of the month, we still use the word calendar to keep track of them. Now, have you ever wondered why Easter never takes place on the same Sunday in the same way that Christmas or New Year's Eve or something like that always takes place on the same day? But Easter has to be a Sunday and it's never the same Sunday. Easter follows a lunar calendar and since we have a pre-agreed upon date for Easter for the next years and years and decades, we have to assume that it is someone's job to keep track of this alternative calendar that contradicts the one we use in everyday life. That person is His Holiness Francis, Bishop of Rome, Vicar of Jesus Christ, successor of the Prince of the Apostles, Supreme Pontiff of the Universal Church, Primate of Italy, Archbishop and Metropolitan of the Roman Province, Sovereign of the Vatican City-State, and Servant of the Servant of God and his council of pontiffs. If you're like me, one thing pops out from this list of holy titles. Supreme Pontiff of the Universal Church. Now, Supreme Pontiff is just the English version of Pontifex Maximus. Pontifex Maximus is a title held by another very, 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 very famous person in history, Julius Caesar. Now Caesar is critically important to understanding what day it is and what year it is. We have a whole month of the year named after him, July, because he was Gaius Julius Caesar. And we even have another month named after his adopted son, Gaius Julius Caesar Augustus. July and August. Now, why does any of this matter? We must first go back to the year 46 BCE, 2065 years ago, roughly the time of the title of this video. The reason for that is because that is the year where we, we, started using our current method of telling time. Before we get into that aspect of the story, we have to take a brief, if somewhat dramatic, dive even further back into the past, to the year 331 BCE. The year is 331 BCE, and Alexander the Great, and if you're watching this in the future, click here for my video on Alexander the Great, and if you're watching this on release, stay tuned for that. But as I was saying, Alexander the Great has conquered most of the New World, which included Egypt. Now, Alexander found himself in a predicament. He needed to found a new city to become the new Hellenistic capital of Egypt. What happened next will positively shock you, because King Alexander the Great named his great new Hellenistic capital of Egypt Alexandria, after himself. What an amazing idea. And it was such a good idea that he went to found another 69 cities and named them all after himself. And you might be asking yourself, why does any of that matter? I thought we were talking about Caesar and the calendar. Why are we talking about Alexander the Great? We still are, because what happened next is the really important part. Alexander the Great spoiler alert, died in 323 BCE. It meant that now someone had to take over Egypt. 
the person who was originally designated to take over the governorship of Egypt was a man named Cleomenes of Naucratis. You have almost certainly never heard of him, or even if you had heard of him, you probably forgot about him, tells a story in and of itself. Because in one of history's all-time great switcheroos, one of Alexander the Great's generals, a man named Ptolemaeus, who, because, let's be honest, Philip of Macedon couldn't keep it in his toga, may or may not have been Alexander's half-brother, surprised everyone, invaded Egypt, kicked Cleomenes out, and proceeded to install himself as governor of Egypt. But that wasn't the end of it. Ptolemaeus then pulled another, arguably more legendary or more notorious, depending on your personal standpoint, all-time great switcheroo, when he straight up stole the body of Alexander the Great on its way back to his birthplace. That meant that Ptolemaeus, citing the fact that Alexander was now deified, a literal god, Ptolemaeus could claim to be in possession of a god whom he happened to be related to. Possibly. Maybe. Probably. But anyway, in the year 305 BCE, Ptolemaeus made himself pharaoh of Egypt and retitled himself, moderately as befits any true Hellenic monarch, Ptolemaeus I Soter, or Ptolemaeus the Saviour despite the fact that he was a foreign invading general. He still called himself the savior. Because Hellenistic monarchs have never been, never been too self-aware. Now this Ptolemaeus and his descendants would go on to form the so-called Ptolemaic dynasty, and they ruled Egypt for 275 years, plus minus one. The Ptolemaic dynasty managed to pro produce a staggering 15 Ptolemy, I don't know what the official plural of Ptolemaeus is, but before they were finally put down, much to the relief of historiographers everywhere, they also produced a lot of Arsinoes and Berenices, but the ones we're mainly interested in from the Ptolemaic dynasty is the Cleopatras. You can probably already guess from the name, the one we're interested in is Cleopatra, the seventh of her name, Thea Pelopatra. And in true Hellenistic monarchical fashion, the name Father's Pride, the seventh, father loving deity, really rams home how incredibly regal and father loving and godly she was. Just knowing her name was enough to make you feel like an inferior person in comparison. But from the year 48 BCE, the aforementioned Julius Caesar and the stunning and intellectual Cleopatra were diplomatically bonding and carnally making regal divine babies that were supposed to take over the world. And it is from this famously infamous Cleopatra that we get to the untold hero of the story, a man named Sisykines of Alexandria. Now, Sisykines of Alexandria was a Greek astronomer and one of the one of the plethora of intellectual onhangers at the Macedonian royal court at Alexandria. He, along with Caesar, devised the foundations of what we now call the Julian calendar. So Sikines was inspired by a very old way of keeping time that had been attempted during the time of Ptolemaeus III but had been rejected by the people of Egypt on account of its weirdness and needing to keep track of days and leap years when you could also, you know, not do that. And Caesar found no problem with this. Caesar was, much like Pope Francis is today, Pontifex Maximus, High Priest of Rome. And much like it is today, 2065 years ago, it was the job of the Pontifus Maximus and his council of pontiffs to keep track of time. The Pontifus Maximus was an ancient religious office, even by contemporary standards, and more importantly, it was a lifelong position. By Caesar's time, and the time Caesar was in office, it had become a heavily politicized office and skewed in favor of the aristocratic nobility. 
It seemed that every time a populist candidate won election to Rome's highest office, the consulship, the high priest would find some excuse why the heavens were against it. This often resulted in their terms being significantly shorter than the previous years. The days, and sometimes weeks or even months, were taken from their year in office just to magically be found in favor of the gods when a conservative held the consulship. In practice, that meant that depending on who was in office, the calendar could differ widely between years, and this was a tried and true method of the Roman Republic to simply drag your feet and wait out your opponent, and wait out their term of office. And while this was a true passion project of Caesar's, and one he saw as leveling the playing field of Roman politics forever, at that point in our story, Caesar himself had been far too busy to justify dedicating enormous time on something as unglamorous and medial as counting days between full moons. And his best intentions, the calendar had drifted months off its axis. So this resulted from the fact that Caesar had spent the better part of the previous decade out of the country conquering Gauls north of Italy. He did with a mixture of brilliant and strategic and tactical thinking, clever use of diplomacy and um, uh, premeditated acts of genocide. But moving on, Caesar now desperately needed to fix the cripplingly dysfunctional Roman calendar and make sure that things didn't spiral out of control again when he would leave the country on military expedition or worse, revert back to the power of conservative politicians after he died. Now, Caesar, guided by the wisdom of our good friend Sosigenes of Alexandria, solved this by simply adding 90 days to the current year, 46 BC, telling everyone, just basically trust me. We did the math, everything makes sense, don't worry about it. Just, I fixed it for the next 2000 years, don't worry about it. If anyone disagreed with him, well, Caesar would just do it anyway, because he was the most powerful man in Rome. He held unrivaled political power. And to paraphrase the man himself, because you, that's why. And Caesar could, in his power as dictator of Rome and high priest of Rome, Pontifex Maximus, unilaterally bring forward this sign and put into motion plans that impacted the lives of every single person living within the emerging Roman Empire. So in the year 45 BCE, 2064 years ago, the so-called Julian calendar and the Julian way of keeping time took off. But they also kind of got it wrong. And due to the minor incident of Caesar being stabbed 23 times by fellow senators in the theater of Pompey the Great, it wasn't until the time of Caesar's adopted son Augustus that the problem was permanently fixed. And so, in the year 45 BCE was the first year that we, human beings, Western civilization, whatever you want to call it, started using our current way of tracking time. Apart from the Gregorian fixings and, and alterations later, it is still the method of time that we use. So now that we know why it could and or should be the year 2064, let us then examine the reasons that it isn't. We, meaning the ill-defined Western Christian civilization, whatever, hold on to our traditions like a dog with a bone. That's just the way things have always been done and that's the way they should continue to stay. And in this context, the Christian part of Western civilization is the most important and critical part of the question. Because in the early 4th century AD or CE, depending on who you ask, a very important Roman was proclaimed Caesar in the city of modern-day York on the island of Britannia. Caesar was by then not the name of a person, but had evolved and subsequently evolved 
into an honorific title held by the second most powerful man in the state, with the most powerful man in the state holding the title of Augustus. Now that man was Flavius Valerius Constantinus. We simply know him today as Constantine the Great. This Constantinus was a very peculiar Roman indeed, because rather than being the traditionally pagan uh, polytheistic Roman, he was an adherent to a strained, secular, growing cult within the empire and a monotheistic religion, which we now refer to as Christianity. Constantine is very important for two reasons. First of all being that he moved the capital of the Roman Empire to his new city of Constantinople, which is Greek for city of Constantine. See, bit of a pattern emerging. And this move allowed the Roman Empire to live for another 11 centuries. The other hugely significant thing that Constantine did was he normalized Christianity at the top echelon of Roman society. If it were not for that, then our good friend from earlier, Dionysius the Humble, would never have grown up in a Christian Roman Empire. Now, while the changes were not immediate, this brought a huge cultural and political shift within the entire Roman Empire. And anyone who claims with absolute certainty that there's a definitive before and after cutoff point is speaking from unreliable sources about unverifiable dates. In order to explain what a monumental shift this actually was, we have to look at what came before that and what is in today's term the ancient way of telling time. Quickly sum up, only Roman historians, all of which were fancy rich senators and aristocrats, timed things since the founding of the city. As ordinary Romans had until that point for more than a thousand years referred to the years in terms of who the two consuls were. A consul is the term that the Romans used for their one-year head of state, highest elected official. To take an example of that in practice, uh, a year famous for the end of the Brothers Gracchi and the very famous and expensive vintage of wine. Now, a, some historical research or googling would tell you that that was the year 121 BCE. As I said, the Romans were kind of weird about this. They would not say the year 121 BC, nor would they say the year 632 since the founding of the city of Rome. They would say it was the year consulship of Lucius Opimius and Quintus Fabius Maximus Allobrogicus. As strange as this practice comes across to us, it gets even stranger when you factor in that this meant that in order to be able to carry any sort of conversation at the market or the baths or wherever you were within the Roman Republic or the Roman Empire, you needed to know off the top of your head anywhere between 20 and over a hundred pairs of politicians just to be able to keep up with the conversation. As I mentioned before, the calendar was the first day of the month and the Romans didn't have a way to number days. So I am recording on the 29th of August, but the Romans would not have said that. They would have said, they would not have said the 29th, they would have said days before the calends of September, which is the next significant day. And I mentioned before Caesar's unfortunate 23 times stabbing, and that took place on arguably the most famous date in Roman history on the Ides of March, or to put it in Roman terms, the mid-month market day of the month of Mars, the god of war. And depending on which month it was and which year it was, the Ides would take place on the 13th or the 15th. Of if there was a simple and logical way to do something, you can bet your life on it that the Romans found a way to needlessly convolute it. This all changed with the conversion of Constantine and the Roman conversion to Christianity. Unfortunately, we know virtually nothing about this period in history because 
as all the historical and archaeological evidence show, the new Christian rulers wiped the history books, or history scrolls more accurately, was completely of their not so holy act, because conquering an empire via civil war usually requires a lot of starving and killing and raping and pillaging that doesn't really fit in with the image that the new Christian rulers were trying to make for themselves. And so we again re-emerged around the 6th century with a uniform picture of the world where the monotheistic Jehovah, a translational take on Jupiter, is at the forefront of everything from the creation of the universe until our very time. And this, again, was split into before Christ and after Christ by our good friend Dionysius the Humble, the monk from the Black Sea. And that is the reason that, that it is not the year 2064, the year which our current way of keeping track started, but the year 2020 in the year of our Lord Jesus Christ. 